How do you kill someone with voodoo? This is a video that I've been trying to make for a long time. The script has changed several times already, just within the past month. I'll be talking about traditional African religions, which is a tricky thing to do because Africa is huge. So to narrow it down, I had to focus on West African religions. I'm also going to be using the phrase African spirituality as an umbrella term for many religions and practices, just because even though I am narrowing things down to West Africa, that's still a lot of cultures and beliefs. Now, I am Yoruba, and my immediate family are not the most devout Muslims, but we fast during Ramadan and all that. Extended family, some are more devout than others, some are even Christian. However, all my family has a respect for Ifa. We don't really buy into the belief that our ancestors were backwards people worshipping devils and then were saved by Islam and Christianity. Respect for Yoruba culture came first. So as a Yoruba person, I'm going to be mentioning Ifa and Orisha a lot more because that's what I'm most familiar with. So because of the transatlantic slave trade, the religions that were brought to the Americas by enslaved Africans were changed because Africans were not allowed to worship their religions in some areas, so there was some syncretizing with indigenous American practices and Catholicism. That's what happened with Voodoo and Ifa, which is known by many names in the Americas like Santeria, Regla de Ocha, Lukumi, Candomblé. Sorry if I mess up the pronunciation, I'm going to be doing that a lot. I will also be mentioning Christianity quite a bit too. Now, before anyone comments, I know Christianity existed in Africa long before, but I'm not talking about Ethiopian denominations of Christianity. I'm talking about Africans who were introduced to Christianity through religious imperialism and colonialism by Europeans, showing white Jesus, not 4C Jesus. Speaking of colonialism, because of it, countries and kingdoms that used to exist don't anymore. So you have the merging of different ethnic groups and cultural overlap in how a deity or spirit is depicted and even just the name. For example, there are many variations of the goddess figure Mami Wata. Think of how ancient Greek and Roman mythology kind of overlap with each other or the cultures and mythologies of ancient Mesopotamia. I say all this to say that I'm going to get things wrong. I'm sure I already have. But I like learning so please feel free to correct me and show me the links and articles and books, podcasts, whatever, tweet threads that you can link me to so I can further educate myself. Especially if you have any of the religions that were mentioned. Alright, so with that disclaimer done, we can begin. In 2013, actor Lee Thompson Young, best known for his role as the famous Jet Jackson, tragically took his own life. The actor suffered from bipolar disorder and depression. When his death was being reported, E! News mentioned that he was practicing Yoruba, a Nigerian religion, and that he visited a small village in Africa for something reportedly related to the religion. So there were many things wrong with this article, and E! News were dragged for it, as you can imagine. So Yoruba is the name of an ethnic group in West Africa, and also the name of the language that they speak. The traditional religion of Yoruba people is called Ifa. As for the whole small village in Africa, geography is a thing. I mention this instance because, at the time, there was this rush to attribute Thompson Young's death to something more sinister just from hearing the words African, religion, secret village and death. The subtext is all there and your mind will rush in to fill in the gaps of centuries worth of racist imagery and demonization of Africans and African spirituality. So... Traditional African beliefs have been demonised from the moment Europeans hopped off their boats. They pretty much did this with any place they went to where the people of that land were not worshipping a white Jesus. Even pagan religions in Europe were demonised once Christianity came to town. The old lady still worshipping Epona. She's the witch. Yeah, she's the witch. 
I was just about to accuse her. Then there is the word demon. It comes from the Latin translation of the ancient Greek word, which refers to a lesser deity and means godlike or powerful. I mean, we could get into some really deep shit and discuss how turning someone's gods into monsters is the foundation of religious imperialism, but we don't have time for all that. Historians and practitioners of the many types of voodoo and voodoo attribute the intense demonization of their religions and all African religions in general to the Haitian Revolution. Here is a highly condensed version to those who don't know. The Haitian Revolution began in 1791. It was one of the few successful revolts led by enslaved black people against the white slavers in the Americas. One of the most prominent leaders was Toussaint Louverture. To put it short, the Haitians kicked the French, the British and the Spanish off that side of the island. During enslavement, black people were allowed to congregate together for religious practices. One of the religions, of course, being Voudon. White slavers thought it was harmless because they believed it kept black people subordinate. Truth is, a lot of important meetings were happening during these congregations, like the planning of an uprising. It is said that days before the rebellion, people prayed to the Lobas, the names of spirits in Voudun, to give them strength and courage for the rebellion to be successful. Nothing strange about that. Many people pray before a big war or embarking on something very dangerous. The prayer was led by Doti Bukman, a Hongan, and Cecile Fatiman, a Mambo. The events that took place on Boy's Command with Dirty Bookman and Cecile Fatiman has been surrounded in mystery, half-truths and whole-ass lies. The ritualistic slaughter of an animal was involved and it sounds like it was not too different from Jewish or Islamic slaughter. Some historians have suggested that Bookman may have been Muslim since he was born in Senegal, Gambia area, later to be kidnapped and taken to Jamaica and later sold to the Haitian plantation. So the revolution was successful and news travelled everywhere, Europe and the Americas. White slave owners with large plantations were worried about revolts happening to them. Slave rebellions were happening all the time, but they would always get put down, leaving many black people dead. But this one had black people taking over an entire country, so white people did their best to make sure black people wouldn't find out about this. Also, this story really scared white people because of the mention of something non-Christian was involved. This is what sparked off the anti Voudon propaganda and the long held belief that Voudon was akin to devil worship that still exists today. In 2010, after the earthquake that devastated Haiti, evangelical Christian Pat Robertson got on TV and declared that Haiti was cursed because they made a pact with the devil to free them from slavery. Instead of, you know, just being good little Negroes and serving white men and white Jesus. Christy, something happened a long time ago in Haiti and uh, people might not want to talk about it. They were under the heel of the French, uh, you know, Napoleon the Third and whatever. And they got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you'll get us free from the French. Mm. It's a true story. And so the devil said, okay, it's a deal. And uh, they kicked the French out. You know, the Haitians revolted and got themselves free. But ever since, they have been cursed by, by one thing after the other, desperately poor. That island of Hispanola is one island. Mm -hmm. It's cut down the middle. On the one side is Haiti. On the other side is the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic. Yeah. Dominican Republic is, is prosperous, mm -hmm. healthy, full of resorts, etc. Mm -hmm. Haiti is in desperate poverty. Same island. Sure. Uh, they need to have, and we need to pray for them, a great turning to God. And out of this tragedy, I'm optimistic something good may come. Hey, shut your bitch ass up, nigga. Nobody asked you about a bitch ass thing. You better shut the fuck up before I knock your fucking head off your shoulders, old ugly ass bitch. This piece of shit believes that Voodon is the cause of all of Haiti's problems, and he is not the only idiot that thinks this. Since the 1990s, neo evangelical Christians have been circulating this belief. Yeah, because that's the problem. Voudon, not the fact that France forced Haiti to pay them reparation for the loss of property, which you know included slaves, so enslaved people have to pay France for loss of them. So yeah, they demanded 150 million gold francs in exchange that they would recognize Haiti as an independent nation. Countries like the US would refuse to trade with Haiti, as pro-slavery Thomas Jefferson had a vested interest to see a black nation fail. This drove Haiti into massive debt, and later on, the United States would continue to fuck over Haiti, as well as the United Nations. 
The long list of heinous shit the UN has done is just awful. Haiti has been exploited by countries around the world for centuries as punishment for the revolution. It's not an accident that it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. But no, let's blame voodoo instead. With this anti voodoo propaganda machine going on for centuries, a lot of misconceptions surrounding voodoo and African spiritualities in general have formed. Many religions and folklore around the world have some type of trickster figure. They could be a god or a spirit, some type of anthropomorphic animal. These trickster figures are usually neutral, they're neither good nor bad. In African and Afro-descended folklore and religions, you have trickster figures everywhere. There is Anansi the Spider, Mbeku the Tortoise, Brer Rabbit and Eshu, just to name a few. From my understanding and research, Christianity doesn't really have trickster figures like that. I mean, you could say the serpent that tricks Eve is one, but he's an extension of the devil. Alright, let's talk horns. In many religions that predate Christianity, there are deities that have horns. There are a few in Africa. Most people know the Egyptian ones, but there's also Ikenga of the Igbo-originated religion or the Nani. He's a big deal. He's a god of achievement and time and a bunch of other things. Horns are a big hell no in Christian demonology. Satan and other demons are depicted as being red and black monsters with bull horns or ram horns. The devil has a whole goat-like theme going on sometimes as well. Not too far from the look of a fawn or a satyr like Pan from Greek mythology. Satyr. Satan. Satyr. Satan. Anyways, imagine Christian missionaries who already see anything non-Christian as being automatically bad coming to Africa and seeing these dark-skinned people worshipping gods with traits that resemble their own depiction of Satan. While making this video, I went to different forums and talked to Nigerian Christians and learned that in Yoruba translation of the Bible, Satan is translated to Eshu. Remember what I said earlier about turning gods into monsters? Now imagine if Satan was depicted differently, modelled after the trickster Reynard the Fox from European fables. Missionaries that went to Japan and saw the Inari shrine with the Kitsune statues, they would come to the same conclusion that these people were worshipping Satan. I mean, I'm sure they already thought that already, but it would have been much worse. And the movie The Witch would be quite a different movie. By now you can kind of understand why we have the modern misconception of African religions. European Christians were judging everything that Africans were doing by their own belief system. A much more infamous example of this would be the voodoo doll. My voodoo doll of mom. Yet yeah, totally throw, it never worked anyway. Ow! What the hell was that? Oh, keep! Ah! The voodoo doll, as most people know it, really has nothing to do with voodoo. Like many cultures, there are small sculptures of doll-like figures that do all sorts of things, but the whole practice of using a doll as an avatar to inflict pain is an aspect that shows up in European folklore for witches. Puppets were used to aid in magic, and clay bodies where pins and nails were stuck into were used to cause harm. Hollywood voodoo is the name of the trope that showcases a very exaggerated, false, and racist depiction of voodoo, and in turn, all African spiritualities. The earliest example of the trope put to film was of course the 1932 horror movie, White Zombie. Zombie! This movie was so popular that many films would follow the same formula in the 1930s and 40s. Oftentimes, studios would slap on the name Voodoo or Zombie to a title to guarantee an audience. With films like I Walked With a Zombie, a tale of terror and voodoo, of witchcraft and zombies, and all the weird black magic that the white man seldom sees. Are you trying to tell me that the voodoo priest could cure Mrs. Holland? Better, Doc. This is the ceremony of voodoo death, a ceremony that seeks the life of the woman who lives forever. And voodoo man. The modern idea for what voodoo involves came from these early movies. They were most people's first introduction to voodoo and zombies, and they would go on to inspire very similar depictions in books, comics, TV, movies, and video games around the world for the following decades. The 1970s was really a time for supernatural horror, 
And it saw the rise of black exploitation films, some of them written and directed and produced by black men, and some that weren't. American International Pictures produced a string of black exploitation films, some of them combined with horror. The first one was 1972's cult classic Blackula, starring William Marshall and directed by William Crane. I found a lot of tangible resistance mm-hmm. and maybe even tangible. Resentment. Racism. Yeah. Well, for racism, I mean, nobody... Because I'm sure your crew was predominantly white. Oh, everybody was white. All right. I can't... Re- right now, I can't right. remember anyone else black that was on that set. There was something of a resentment on the part of many producers who didn't want our voices to ring resonantly about and create a, a new kind of genre. Since supernatural horror was a trend of the 70s, supernatural horror starring black people, of course, had to have voodoo. The popularity of Blackula led to a sequel being released a year later, entitled Scream, Blackula, Scream. The sequel wasn't directed by William Crane. In this film, voodoo plays a major role in the plot. Are things accurate? Yes and no. What was accurate was that there was an actual community that were doing something that many people do, coming together to pay their respects and mourn the loss of a spiritual leader. Pam Gray's character Lisa even outright says this. To us... Voodoo is simply a religion based on faith. There is respect that is shown for African cultures and history, Blackula himself being part of the Ibani tribe, although some things that they say are wrong when it comes to the language and cultural clothing, but they tried and it was the 70s and who knows what the African section in a local library was like. One downside is they kept using the word cult, and despite the dictionary's definition, we all know that it is used as a pejorative and carries such negative connotations. The voodoo in the film is shown to be a powerful, supernatural force that is used by both antagonist and protagonist. In 1974, there were three horror films starring black women, 20th Century Fox's The House on Skull Mountain starring Janie Mitchell, and AIP released two, Sugar Hill starring Marky Bay and Abby starring Carol Speed. The House on Skull Mountain is your basic Hollywood voodoo trope. Everything that you saw in White Zombie and all the others, you'll see it here, just in colour. It's not a black exploitation movie, so the date is saved by a white male lead. Moving on, Sugar Hill is about a photographer, Diane Sugar Hill, who decides to get revenge on the mobsters that murdered her boyfriend. I want the power to destroy my enemies. Voodoo is shown to be a malevolent force, but the mobsters are a bunch of racist murderers who did have it coming, so yeah. The film does have a happy ending. Sugar kills all her enemies and goes on to live her best life. Almost like Chun-Li's ending in Street Fighter 2. Then there was Abby. Abby was written to ride on the coattails of the exorcist and Rosemary's baby. The titular character is possessed by an African sex demon, a shoe. (sighs) <sighs> Near the end, William Marshall's character, the bishop, says the demon possessing Abby is a lesser spirit pretending to be a shoe. So that's good. Abby is saved by the bishop doing an exorcism and invoking Olorun while wearing West African clothing. I have to wonder with the film Scream, Blackula Scream and Abby whether the actors had any input because there seems to be some research done on both of these films. Since the trope emerged from horror movies, that is where it's most prominent and also where you will find the worst of the worst depictions. From films by acclaimed directors to low-budget video on-demand flicks, voodoo or elements that are associated with voodoo would pop up. But as the years moved on, the trope would go on to transcend the horror genre. Crime dramas are where the trope will find its second home. We saw hints of this in Scream, Blackula Scream. Harlan, what the hell are you talking about? How can you even consider Lisa as a possible suspect? Because this girl's murder tonight is not a normal murder. And if you ask me, the voodoo freaks had something to do with it. Legal. Sir, I don't give a damn about your legal rituals. A candle you sold was placed a few feet from a dismembered child. If you don't have a court order, I'm not giving you our list. Why not? If your church outlawed ritual murder, your members have nothing to fear from us. Except for persecution based on your bigotry. Now, should I show you to the door? Or can you find your own way out? You can drop the detective character in the exotic backdrop of Haiti or Louisiana or pretty much anywhere in the Caribbean, where the culture and the people are so foreign and scary, making the character a fish out of water that needs to come in and take charge. The plot would normally revolve around an occult murder, and voodoo paraphernalia was found at the scene of the crime. 
It's not a crime drama, but it has crime fighting. The Incredible Hulk had this one episode set in New Orleans where there was this voodoo con man that was tricking all the gullible people to believing that fireworks were caused by him and not by, you know, fireworks. Like, this... And the spirits know that, Louis. They'll remove the curse left by the rat that bit you. He can rest for a few minutes in the lobby. Let my magical Grigri take effect. We'll prepare a special mojo to protect him through the night. Only until tomorrow. Now you understand, Celine, it's very important for Louis that you both come back here tomorrow. Yes, Mamborini. All right. I had to watch this shit. It was so bad. Oh my fucking... Comedies would just mention voodoo or have the image of a character sticking pins in a doll and wearing something vaguely African inspired like a mask or clothes. Or sometimes there's a woman with a poorly done generic Caribbean, Louisiana Creole or African accent done quite poorly. Fantasy genres are a weird one because they will have magic be an important part of the plot that a character may use. However, when the magic practices are that of an African origin, it's seen as scary and primitive compared to the more refined European kind. If you're lucky, some lip service might be paid that it can be used for good too, but it's rarely ever shown, and it's always been referred to as black magic. Notice how the trope tends to feature black women as the leader of the religion or just the central focus. There are a few types of black women that show up in this trope, the kind old wise witch woman, the evil old witch woman, hypersexualized, super fetishized young seductress, the hateful woman that has the power to enact vengeance, so she's the scariest. All of them added to the horror aspect because it was black women wielding power that they could use against white people in these films. But also it would fetishize them too as these exotic, sexually dangerous women that were devoid of any inhibitions. This aspect of the trope stems from the fact that in 1800s Louisiana, there were about 15 voodoo queens or priestesses, with Marie Laveau being the most famous one. Marie Laveau held social power by being a hairdresser and matchmaker. She would also play up parts of voodoo and hoodoo rituals and prayers for spectators, even though the power she held was minuscule compared to the white men of the time, but it was enough to have white people scared. In the Child's Play series, Chucky invokes the Sky Father, and most important of all the Loas, Dambala, to transfer his soul into a good guy's doll. He also uses a voodoo doll to kill a practitioner. I'd like to point out that voodoo does incorporate ancestor worship, so whose ancestors are you worshipping Charles Lee Ray? I was glad to see they did away with all of that in the reboot and opted for a technology is scary black mirror type of plot. The 2004 British TV show Hex depicted enslaved Africans practicing voodoo and praying for a sick child. Later on in the episode, we learn that the white mistress of the manor became obsessed with voodoo and sacrificed someone so she could summon Azazel, the fallen angel turned demon from Abrahamic religion. How the hell does this work? How are you going to do a voodoo ritual to summon a Christian demon? Given the time period, the location and the language that the African people were speaking, the voodoo here is not the type that would be syncretized with Catholicism. This is something that happens a lot. African religions being used as an evil conduit for summoning demons, particularly Christian ones. It has never made sense to me. If voodoo can be used to summon Christian demons, why not use it to summon Nor the Norse wolf Fenrir or the Irish Banshee or even the Slavic Baba Yaga? Fuck it, we can even get Yuki Ona from Japanese folklore and throw in a skinwalker from the Navajo and have one big monster mash. Baron Samdi. Out of all the lowers out there, Baron Samdi shows up everywhere. I get it, he looks the most scary, the top hat, the skull, the face paint and the cigar, he looks cool. There is such a huge focus on this lower or just death in general that it gives off the impression that voodoo is obsessed with death and that isn't the case. Baron Samdi shows up even when he's not mentioned but because he has brand recognition, he's always there. Retired wrestler Charles Wright wrestling persona is clearly based off of Baron Samdi but his persona was named Papa Shango. Shango is an orisha of thunder and lightning, he's very important. There's a version of him in Haitian voodoo called Nago Shango. Charles Wright went with the Baron Samdi look because, you know, scary and cool looking, but they didn't want to copy the name from the Bond film Live and Let Die. 
which was still fresh in everyone's minds at, at the time. But his AKA was Baron Samdi too, so I don't get it. A more recent example would be, of course, American Horror Story. There was a character there called Papa Legba. In Voodoo, Papa Legba is the lower of the crossroads and communication. They are also a trickster. His colours are red and black. He's often depicted as an old man or a young child, and there's some overlap there with Eshua Legba or Eluga or whatever they call him in that religion. Like I said, a lot of overlap going on. This character isn't Papa Legba. This is Baron Samdi that has had the Hades treatment. You know, you preside over the dead, so you're basically Satan of a different culture. Hades has really gotten a bad rep over the years. People hear King of the Underworld and suddenly all they can see is That's Satan. Me. I read the reason why they chose to call this Baron Samdi lookalike Papa Legba was because Baron Samdi is the go-to lower that is shown in the media and they want it to be different. That doesn't make any sense to me. They're not being different. They are still depicting Baron Samdi like everybody else, but you just called him something different. There are a group of lower known as the Gede that are associated with death and fertility and all other types of things. And there are many to choose from. There's even Mama Brigitte, who is the wife of Baron Samdi. And there's also Kalfu that has malevolent aspects to him and is a gatekeeper as well. Like, this isn't 1944. Google is at the palm of your hand and they even had consultants on sets too. So I don't know why they went with Papa Legba instead. And I know they had consultants because I saw Veve on the floor. And you don't normally see Veve when it comes to voodoo in the media. There was one for Dambala and one for Mama Brigitte. So yeah, they knew. They knew what they were doing. Wow, this was long. I had to cut out a lot, but it was still quite long, so I'm splitting this video. In part two, we'll look at African spirituality from black orphan media through the decades and talk about the few positive examples that are out there. I noticed that I've gained some new subscribers, so hello to the new subscribers and to the old ones too. How are you? I am not good at doing outros, so I'll just say join me next time because... I got the voodoo for you bitches!